Thank you for coming today to our presentation. I'm Dr. Ali Botin Fervig. I'm the director of the Center for Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Education. The theme of our program this year is resistance, specifically Jewish resistance. Not, it's called Not Like Lambs to Slaughter. So I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions at the end, feel free to ask. When we're discussing the atrocities of the Holocaust, it's common to hear a question that succeeding generations like yourselves ask, which is, why didn't the Jews fight back sooner? Why didn't they resist? Why didn't they fight back more often? Well, to that question, I will defer to Nobel Prize winning author and Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel, you probably have read his book, Night, either in your high school classes or, or um, elsewhere. And so he suggests reframing that question. He explains, quote, the question is not why all the Jews did not fight, but how so many of them did. Tormented, beaten, starved. Where did they find the strength, spiritual and physical, to resist. What do we mean when we talk about resistance in World War II? Well, with regard to the Holocaust, Jewish resistance was any undertaking to frustrate the German efforts to torment and or kill the Jewish people. It involved armed resistance, unarmed resistance, and participation in partisan activities, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. So there are people who blame the Jews for their own fate. That, by the way, is just a map to show you all of the countries where Germany uh, was, was a presence. These are the occupied, uh, occupied countries. Um, so again, there, would, there are still people who blame the Jews for their own fate rather than creating or having any empathy for their plight, and also for respecting the dignity and the strength of both victims and survivors. Who would believe, after all, that an advanced Western nation like Germany could plan and implement the brutal murder of millions of women, men, and children? If you think about it, Germany at that time was probably the most highly cultured, civilized country. They gave birth to the likes of Beethoven, Mozart, Schopenhauer, Heinrich Heine, um, and various artists. Uh, Goethe, I left out Goethe, the German Shakespeare. Okay, so I guess we can we can conclude, and it's understandable that the initial Jewish response to the Nazis, when they had no idea what was going to happen to them, was just complying with German demands and orders in hopes of preventing them from getting worse. And I think that's, that's, we, can, we can relate to that. So one of the things that the Nazis did to affect their uh, plan was to, errat which was to eradicate the Jewish people, they, f they undertook forced evalu uh, evacuations of the Jewish people from their homes throughout Nazi-occupied occupied Europe. Um, so they would go to the small shtetls, which are towns and villages, and um, order the people to take a few of their belongings and leave. They called it resettlement. Um, in 1939, September of 1939, Reinhard Heydrich issued an order to the chiefs of the uh, Einsatzgruppen, known as the Schnellbrief. And that particular order stated that Jews in Poland, because Poland was really the first uh, country that the Germans went into and occupied. Actually, they had uh, gone into Austria earlier, um, called the Anschluss, and if any of you ever saw the movie or the show, uh, The Sound of Music, that takes place during the Anschluss. Uh, Anschluss. 
Um, so the order stated that the Jewish people who were living in Poland were going to be concentrated, taken from their homes, concentrated in very large towns and cities near railway lines. Why railway lines? Because the proximity facilitated the eventual, the eventual transport of human cargo, I don't like using that term, but they did, from ghetto to death camps with the greatest efficiency. So the Germans built brick and mortar walls and wire around these ghettos, and the ghettos were reinforced by guard dogs and German offices uh, and very tightly guarded checkpoints. So, so escape was, was pretty much not an option. Um, the Nazis also introduced this, this uh, idea of ghettos due to the false theories that they held that Jews spread diseases and therefore should be segregated to protect the rest of the population. And that was very much in line with their racist and eugenic beliefs. Living conditions were unimaginably horrible. Several families were forced to share each house. There were usually seven people um, in each room. The Warsaw Ghetto especially was uh, overcrowded. So the overcrowding coupled with a lack of clean running water and proper sewage systems resulted in poor sanitation and rampant disease and eventual death. Now, the SS were responsible for setting up each ghetto, ensuring that the administration of the ghetto ran smoothly. So in addition to the SS, Jewish councils called Judenrata were set up to carry out and govern the day-to-day um, running of the ghetto, and it was controlled, of course, by the SS, and they had to comply and carry out its demands. Um, so even though many Jewish council members, called the Judenrat, cooperated under compulsion with the Germans until they themselves were deported, some, such as council chair Moisha Jaffe in Minsk, resisted. So I'm not going to do this. He resisted by refusing to comply when the Germans ordered him to hand over his fellow Jews for deportation in June of 1942. Um, another thing about the ghetto was there was no communication. You couldn't have a radio. You couldn't have a telephone. Uh, telegraph communications were verboten upon penalty of death. And publishing newspapers, no, illegal. Prisoners also were forced to wear that yellow ribbon or the yellow star of David, the Mogan David, um, with the word Judah uh, very um, haphazardly scribbled on it. But the Jewish people wore it as a badge of honor, and, you know, so remember that. Um, periodically, the Nazis would just go into the ghettos to terrorize the inhabitants. They also reduced food available of warm clothing, heat, shelter, education, and culture. Medical supplies, very, very sparse, and certainly after the ghettos were sealed off and cut off from the outside world, they ran out of medical supplies as well, and food supplies continued to dwindle. Um, so you can see that there were just so many obstacles to resistance at that point. A, the German military was uh, superior. Uh, the Germans also had this tactic, which was called collective responsibility. What that means is that the Germans vowed to if one person did something, if one person resisted, they would hold their entire families and the communities responsible for whatever act of resistance was um, Committed. The other thing that was an obstacle to resistance was the secrecy about the deportations and the deception of them. The Jews didn't, they, they couldn't have anticipated their fate. Most often they didn't know where they were being sent after they were moved from the ghettos. What the Nazis did, and they did have a brilliant propaganda uh, machine headed by Joseph Goebbels, 
They went so far as to force new arrivals at Auschwitz, for example, to send postcards to their family or their relatives prior to going to the gas chambers saying, arrive safely, I'm doing well. So how did the Jews, and they did eventually, learn about the massacres in all these different places and the gassings in the death camps? After all, remember, the ghettos, little or no access to newspapers or any radio broadcast. They did hear stories, they did hear rumors, often based on reports from the few Jews who managed to escape from deportation trains, shooting sites, or killing centers. But despite this, there was resistance, and it didn't always involve guns and bullets. Resistance against the Nazis, planned and spontaneous, armed and unarmed, took many, many forms throughout World War II and the Holocaust. For many, the struggle uh, for physical existence, uh, there, wa there wasn't uh, any, any question that they had to try to do something. Some did escape through legal or illegal emigration. Others hid. Okay? S those who remained struggled to obtain life's essentials by smuggling in food, clothing, and medication necessary to survive. They had a lot of underground rescue groups and partisan groups who were able to smuggle these things in and also smuggle people out. So resistance was, was very hazardous, as you can imagine. So in addition to the direct threat to those who were engaged in a resistance movement, there was risk of immediate retaliation by the Nazis to the larger population. Okay, so a lot of people said, well, if I do something, it's just not me that's going to be killed. It could be my whole neighborhood. Okay, so what is the what then is unarmed resistance? Well, it's spirit, it's, it consists of several things. Spiritual and cultural resistance. What does that mean? Well, Despite the Nazis' orders that education cease and desist, adults continued educating their children. There was an underground library. There were underground uh, schools in most of the ghettos. There were classes in languages, especially Yiddish. And in technical instruction, this is, this is amazing, such as woodworking and leather tanning and nursing all clandestine. In the Warsaw Ghetto, Jews established a medical school for classes in science for those hoping to complete their education after the war. Organized prayer and religious education, of course, was forbidden. But nevertheless, in basements, in attics, and other hidden places, men met for prayer to celebrate the holidays and make sure their children got a, an education about Jewish rituals, prayers, songs, and history. Also, many marriages took place. Babies that were born through, um, babies were born, I'm sorry, babies were born even though that was considered by the Nazis illegal. All right, uh, okay, now we're still on this one. So let's talk about some other unarmed activities. Communication, as I said, they were cut off. They weren't allowed to have radios or, or newspapers, but sometimes they had radios smuggled into the ghettos so they could listen to BBC broadcasts from the Allies. Um, sometimes, too, they would send couriers to other ghettos. They managed to escape, however, you know, digging tunnels, otherwise sneaking out, to find out if rumors were true and to report on events in their own community. And those couriers were more than messengers who were just carrying letters from city to city. They would also carry and dispense forged documents, whether it was a birth certificate, um, uh, baptismal papers, uh, anything that would assist in getting to a safe place. 
Also, archivists. Ghetto archivists collected testimonies from people, reports about daily life in the ghetto, data on forced labor, uh, ration cards, theater posters, poems, posters that announce Jewish deportations, and more. So that after the war, there was evidence, and they managed to hide it. And many, many of those documents were found after liberation. Um, within the Warsaw Ghetto, there was a historian. His name is, was Emanuel Ringelblum. And in collaboration with others, what Mr. Ringelblum did was to create this archive of evidence of Nazi crimes. Ringelbaum initially started the project by himself, but it grew into a group endeavor. And um, it was called, uh, in Hebrew, Oinak Shabbos, which is a Yiddish term, which refers to the traditional community meetings on Shabbat, on, on the Sabbath. And what they did was they buried their extensive collection in milk cans, metal boxes, to prevent the archives from falling into the hands of the Nazis. And as I mentioned, after the war, a lot of those records were recovered. Plus, the Nazis themselves kept meticulous records and photographs. So it's, it's pretty hard to kind of deny Mr. Farrakhan that the Holocaust did, in fact, happen. Also, sabotage. The ghettos became more and more established. So sometimes uh, the Nazis would pull people from the camps, and they weren't in good shape, believe me, for forced labor, including various industries that the Germans um, had. So providing food for the army provided this terrific opportunity for resistance through sabotage. So many purposely maintained, many of the um, workers, the Jewish workers, maintained very low productivity to undermine the Nazis' efforts. Um, tailors, the Jewish tailors would sew uniforms for the Wehrmacht, which was the unified military of Germany, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force. So they were really impossible to wear. Shoemakers, OK? They knocked nails into the soles of the boots to make them totally unwearable. And they put alcohol, uh, they put chemicals, I'm sorry, in alcohol sent to the Eastern Front. And that, that's sabotage, and that's nonviolent uh, resistance. Also, again, the smuggling of food and weapons. Supplies, of course, were very sparse, to the point that a lot of the ghetto inhabitants um, quickly died from starvation. So to try to alleviate, alleviate that problem, they went to great lengths to smuggle food into the ghetto. If caught, they faced death. They took little children, little tiny kids, who would sneak out under the walls and through the city sewer system to return with bread and other items hidden in their clothing. In the ghettos, the Jews also obtained arms by stealing weapons and smuggling them into the ghettos. And in Warsaw, in particular, weapons were obtained from the Polish underground. There were underground resistant movements throughout Europe, throughout Nazi-occupied Europe. Okay. Um, of course, armed resistance was the most direct form of Jewish opposition to the Nazis. And that included also espionage and sabotage of a different sort. Flare-ups of armed resistance did occur when the Nazis um, began the deportations. For example, in Krakow in December of 1942, a Jewish group blew up a cafe favored by German offices in an effort to slow transports. That would surely do it. Also, we have partisan groups. Um, partisan, a partisan fighter is, um, I guess, comparable to a guerrilla fighter. Okay, some of the people who uh, escaped from the trains, escaped from the ghettos, and even concentration camps fled to the forests where they joined other underground movements known as the partisans. They were, again, guerrilla fighters. Um, between 1941 and 1943, underground resistant movements developed in about 100 Jewish ghettos and Nazi-occupied 
occupied Eastern Europe. They forged identity documents, they printed and distributed anti-Nazi literature, and they assisted in dangerous escape and rescue efforts. They blew up thousands of supply trains, convoys, and bridges. They sabotaged or destroyed power plants and factories and other strategic targets. And um, it was basically the, the partisans for the most part consisted, initially anyway, of young men and women, ma mainly teenagers. Um, so they would smuggle the forged documents and newspapers into the ghettos. Many of the partisan fighters were women um, because, well, there were a few reasons. If they got caught, um, you know, if Jewish men were circumcised, so it was easy to identify a Jewish man. And also, the women that they picked to be as couriers had blonde hair and blue eyes. So they could dress up like a peasant, a farm girl, and bicycle around the countryside. And they were called ghetto girls. And they had, I don't know how to even describe it. They had courage. They had nerves of steel. They paid off Gestapo guards. Everybody, everybody has their price. They hid revolvers in loaves of bread, jars of marmalade and they helped build systems of underground bunkers. The ones who were blonde and blue-eyed would flirt with German soldiers. They would bribe them with wine, with whiskey, and home cooking, and they would lose, use their Aryan looks to, to seduce them and then shoot them and kill them. They bombed uh, German train lines. They blew up a, a town's water supply. Um, Rinia Kukielka was a weapons smuggler and a messenger who risked death traveling across Poland by foot and by train. Okay. So um, between 1941 and 1943, underground resistant movements developed in the 100 or so ghettos. And their main goals were to organize the uprisings, break out of the ghettos, and join the partisan groups in a fight against the Germans. Look, the Jews knew that the uprisings would not stop the Germans, and that only a handful of them would succeed in trying to escape and to join the partisans, but yet they made the decision to resist. Um, one of the first partisan groups was the United Partisan Organization in the Vilna Ghetto, established in January of 1942, and it was led by uh, Abba Kovna, he was actually a poet. Um, and he attempted to arouse Jews throughout all of Eastern Europe to undertake armed resistance. Um, they were unable to stage and generate an uprising within the Vilna ghetto, although a few hundred um, fighters escaped to the forests. Uh, you know, the, the reason the partisans could do what they did was because of the geography of the land. So it was either mountainous, where they could hide, or it, they had densely, very thick, dense forests, which would hide them. And they lived there. They had a community there. Um, and so uh, in July of 1944, the Vilna Partisan Group participated in the liberation of Vilna, and that had to mean so much to them. Uh, Warsaw Ghetto, that's probably the most famous uprising. That was a, re a revolt by Polish Jews under Nazi occupation against deportation to Treblinka. Treblinka was one of the extermination camps. So when word reached the ghetto through these couriers who, you know, carry the messages from other ghettos back and forth, when word reached the ghetto that the SS were planning to raise whatever was left of the Warsaw Ghetto, the Jews knew that their resistance would not stop the Germans, and yet they made the decision to resist. The, f the fighting organization of the Warsaw uh, Ghetto had less than 500 fighters, but they were prepared. They had um, gasoline bombs, hand grenades, pistol, pistols, a few submarine guns, 10 rifles, and they mounted the largest armed resistance organized by any targets of Nazi mass murder.
They were unwilling to risk casualties in the wake of their defeat at Stalingrad. This was the Germans. And so they gave up the attempt. But they returned in April of 43, much better prepared. They had armored vehicles. They had artillery. They had aircraft. They had heavy caliber machine guns. But the Jews, not to be outdone, had prepared an elaborate uh, system of bunkers and underground passages, and they were able to hold the Germans off for almost a month. The SS burned down buildings. They dynamited the place. They smoked out the bunkers for a few days. But the, the Jewish tenacity was, was astounding. And the Nazis crushed the uprising anyway. They shot many on spots. They transported many to killing centers. Um, on May 8th, the commander of the rebel forces, Mordechai Anielowicz, fell in battle. And so after he died, many of the rebels escaped from the ghetto, establishing a partisan group that operated in the forests. Um, and thousands of the Jewish dead from the Warsaw Uprising just would remain buried in the rubble. But that was the first large-scale revolt against Nazi occupation. Did it save Jewish lives? No. But its moral and its symbolic significance is an assertion that life cannot be underestimated. Tak, ta akcja była pierwsze trupy nim tego niezwyciężonego Niemca. Fakt, że on może być zabity, tak samo jak każdy człowiek na ulicy, nie było zabity dwóch czy trzech, czy rannych, to jest bez znaczenia. Ale to, że ten hełm niemiecki się przewrócił i spadł, to to w Warszawie zrobiło kolosalne. I to był ten nacisk na tą komendę główną Polski. I działanie Łary, to selection of Jews. That time they grabbed 10,000 Jews, I think. I was sleeping, and all of a sudden I hear, alles arute, alles runte. So, you know, I had military boots. I wore a leather jacket, a leather pilot's cap. I ran to the basement. I came to the basement, a basement full of Jews. Woman, children. I said, the Germans are going to be so stupid. You know? And before you know it, he says, arouse to Papuch the Juden with a hand grenade. You know? And there was a square ledge on the top that people used to go down with a ladder to the basement. Over there, there was a store. As much strength as I had, I jumped, I grabbed myself on that thing, and I pulled myself up, and I come into the store. It's, it's an open store. And the people I see are standing in line. And the SS goes around with the submachine guns. So I, there was another door. I ran into the other door, and there was a folding bed, flat down. So I raised the folding bed to cover myself. And I was sitting there maybe 10, 15 minutes. The Jews in the line, they saw me, of course. But after 15 minutes, I got up, jumped in back, back into the basement. They was all, there still anybody in the basement? There was nobody there. They were all taken out. OK, so I said there were other ghetto uprisings not as well known in Bialystok. Uh, there was an uprising that erupted in August, summer of August of 
Um, most of the rebels, including their leader, Mordechai Tenenbaum Tamarov, fell in the battle, uh, but some escaped the ghetto and continued the partisan struggle outside of the town. Okay, uh, Bialystok, there we go. Okay, Minsk. Minsk was the capital of Belarus. My grandfather and my great-grandparents lived in Minsk in a shtetl. Um, it was in the Russian Pale of Settlement. The family originally was from Poland, but in the 1800s, Poland um, was divided in three ways, and the part that was given to Russia became the Pale of Settlement. Um, if you saw the movie or the show Fiddler on the Roof, Tevya lives in the Pale of Settlement. Um, and so that, that particular ghetto was created right after the Germans invaded uh, the Soviet Union and was the largest in uh, the occupied territory. There were about 100,000 Jews, most of them were murdered in the Holocaust. Um, my grandfather came, came here long before uh, the Second World War, but you know there were relatives there that, that, that didn't. Um, so um, in 1941 in Minsk, the Germans conducted uh, what's called an Aktion in several of the streets, which means they rounded Jews up. So they rounded about 12,000 Jews, murdered them right then and there. And a second action took place in November of 1941, where the Germans uh, murdered another 7,000 Jews. Um, after those two actions, the ghetto underground uh, beefed up their activities and made uh, provisions and preparations for escapees to the forest and started extending and expanding its network of safe places to hide. Because everybody that wound up in the forest wasn't a fighter. There were, you know, uh, grandparents there. There were men, there were women, there were children. Um, and all of the participants, um, I'd like you to remember in these uprisings, fought, for, they knew they weren't beating the Nazis. They fought for the sake of Jewish honor and to avenge the slaughter of so many Jews. OK, so the killing centers. So after Germany invaded Poland in 1939, they also opened up forced labor camps where thousands of prisoners died from uh, starvation, from exhaustion, from exposure. And the uh, plants, the, the camps were guarded, of course, by the SS. Um, and it expanded. The camp, they, they expanded very, very quickly. Um, it's key to separate concentration camps from extermination camps, although people died in both. The aim of the Nazi concentration camps was to contain prisoners they considered enemies of the Reich. Uh, last year, for Yom HaShoah, the theme was Hitler's other victims. So it wasn't just Jews. It was six million Jews, yes, but it was also five million non-Jews, including uh, non-Jewish Polish resistors, uh, Catholic priests, member of the clergy, uh, homosexuals, gypsies, the, the Roma and the Sinti gypsies, um, anybody they considered uh, an enemy of the state and the mentally and physically handicapped. They were an equal opportunity uh, murdering machine. So the administration of the camps had a very distinct disregard for inmates' lives and health, of course. And as a result, tens of thousands perished within the camps. Now, the aim of the Nazi extermination camps was to murder and annihilate all races uh, deemed degenerate primarily Jews, but also Roma. But let me insert here that even though Adolf Hitler considered um, Jews a non-race, which means he thought they were a race, but he was insulting them by saying you're a non-race, Jewish is not a race, Adolf. Jewish is an ethno-religious group. 
that's it. But he considered, of course, the whole, he, the Nazi ideology was the Germans were the pure race. Again, a lie. There is no pure race. Okay, they were the superior race. They were the master race. And if you didn't have those characteristics, the blonde, the blue eyes, tall, strong family, nationalism and all that, you weren't fit to inhabit the earth anymore. Um, and as I have said at other presentations, the irony is that if you look at a picture of Hitler and his henchmen, his inner circle, none of them had blonde hair and blue eyes. Most of them were average or short. A lot of them have physical disabilities. And uh, Ernest Rum uh, was gay. So, uh, you know, go figure. Um, anyway, so um, the purpose of the extermination camps was to carry out the final solution. Um, towards the end of the war, the Nazis met in Wannsee, outside of Berlin, and they decided that the best way to exterminate, and that's a term we use, you know, to exterminate rodents and bugs, but they considered Jews vermins, um, was to use chemicals, technology. So they built gas chambers, crematoriums in the camps. So, for example, um, they were at Methausen, Sachsenhausen, Auschwitz, Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück was a woman's prison. Um, and in some of those uh, extermination camps, Nazi doctors performed very cruel medical experiments on prisoners um, or performed euthanasia to uh, murder disabled uh, patients. But there was resistance and revolt even in the killing camps. I think we can go to the next one. So, um, Look, they formed resistance groups because they realized there was no possible escape from the Nazis' aim of total annihilation. So under the most adverse conditions, in several dozen camps, prisoners organized escapes to join partisan units. They also succeeded in initiating resistance and uprisings in the killing centers of Treblinka, Sobibor, and Auschwitz. So, uh, yeah, Treblinka, those are the three. Um, in Treblinka, they organized a resistance group in 40, early of 1943. And when camp operations nearly uh, was completed, the prisoners thought they would be killed and that the camp would be dismantled. Um, so in late 1943, the resistance leaders decided, we'll revolt, why not? So later, a few months later, they quietly seized some weapons from the camp armory, but they were discovered before they could take over the camp. But hundreds of prisoners stormed the main gate in an attempt to escape, and many were, of course, killed by machine guns. More than 300, though, did escape. Um, some of those that escaped were eventually tracked down and killed by SS and police. Um, in Sobibor in 1943, uh, resistors killed 11 members of the SS staff in that camp. And again, close to 300 escaped, breaking through the barbed wire and uh, risking their lives in the minefields outside of the camp. And about 50 survived the war. In Auschwitz in 1944, prisoners assigned to, uh, there were four crematoriums, Crematorium 4 um, in Birkenau rebelled after learning they were going to be killed. So for months, there were young, uh, young women, such as Esther Awashbloom and Ella Gartner, had been smuggling small amounts of gunpowder from a munitions factory within the Auschwitz complex to men and women's camps resistance movement. Um, and so they were under constant guard but the women in the factory took small amounts of the gunpowder. They would wrap it in pieces of cloth or paper. They hid it on their bodies and passed it along in the smuggling chain. And once uh, she received the gunpowder, uh, Rosa Robata, famous name, passed it to her co-conspirators. Uh, co 
Um, and so using that gunpowder, the leaders of the resistance movement planned to destroy the gas chambers, crematorium, and launch the uprising. But the Germans crushed the revolt. 250 prisoners died. Um, and several days after that, the SS identified four Jewish female prisoners who had been involved in supplying the explosive, and of course they were executed. Um, one thing that we need to remember is that the spirit of those who resisted, successful or unsuccessful, those who even saved one life, which we say in Hebrew is a blessing, the spirit of these and other efforts transcends their ability to halt the genocidal policies of the Nazis. They were starved. They were abandoned by the world. No, but no country was willing to take them in uh, at the Evian conference that was held. Yeah, we feel really bad, but we can't do it. The only country that stood up and said, we will take some Jewish people was the Dominican Republic. They were robbed of their property, and they were in a very weak condition, physically and otherwise, to offer resistance. But they did resist. They resisted violently, passively, spiritually, physically, and emotionally throughout the entire process of the final solution. And I love this quote from one of the leaders of the uh, Warsaw Uprising. We will fight not for ourselves, but for future generations, although we will not survive to see it. Our murderers will pay the price for their crimes after we are gone, and our deeds will live forever. And that's the title of this presentation, and our deeds will live forever.